I'm a, a researcher at the DCNET Research Group at the University of Leuven in Belgium. And today I will be talking, well, mainly about cookies, as the title gives away. And I'm trying to, I will try to figure out who left open the cookie jar. So I'm sure, well, every one of you knows, knows about cookies. Um, personally, I, feel, I don't really know how to feel about cookies. So on the one hand, I think they're great because they allow the web to become what it is today. So without cookies, we wouldn't have had, um, uh, we wouldn't be able to log into any website. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the way that cookies were designed uh, allowed them to be, well, to well, give uh, introduced uh, a number of vulnerabilities. Um, for instance, there's a C server attack against, or there was a C server attack against OpenEMR, which is an um, open source medical records um, software. Um, and this C server attack allowed attackers to expose uh, millions of patient records. Um, similarly, in, in PHP My Admin, there was a CSRV uh, vulnerability that allowed attackers to delete records. Um, and then also in uh, wireless routers, uh, there were uh, CSRV uh, vulnerabilities. And these issues are all very recent, so they're from late 2018. And I'm sure that since then, a lot of new CSRV or issues related to how cookies are implemented um, arose. So on the one hand, well, we have the security, but on the other hand, uh, cookies are also uh, used for tracking users online. Uh, so there was a study by people from Clix who found that uh, when they analyzed uh, the browsing behavior of 200,000 German users, they found that on 95% of the pages that they visited, um, there was a third party request to a potential tracker. So I think, well, we can agree that uh, tracking is uh, very per per pervasive and that it's happening everywhere. Um, so there are these, um, well, not so nice things about cookies and users try to defend against these or browsers try to defend against these. So um, on the one hand, we have the built-in browser options. Um, for instance, in most browsers, it's possible to block all third-party cookies. Um, there's a new uh, standard being developed or it's already developed and implemented um, called same site cookies, um, which is, I think, available now in most common browsers. I will uh, come back to this one later and explain how it works. Um, then there are some other more advanced or more specific um, approaches. For instance, Firefox has a built-in tracking protection. Um, Opera has an ad blocker. Uh, Safari um, has this uh, ITP, Intelligent Tracking protect Prevention. And um, next to all these built-in browser options, uh, there's also a bunch of uh, browser extensions. Um, and we, in our study, mainly focused on uh, ad blockers and privacy extensions. So all these things are there, and they work relatively well. Um, so the concept behind it uh, is relatively good. However, um, there's one uh, main pitfall, and that is that all these policies can only work when they're correctly enforced by the browser. So we put this uh, to the test, and we evaluated uh, yeah, several different browsers and many different uh, ad blocking and privacy extensions. And well, I will uh, give a small preview of what is yet to come. Um, so we found vulnerabilities or issues in uh, most of the browsers, and we could bypass all of these uh, browser extensions. 
So in this talk, I will start with a brief background and motivate why we did uh, our research. Um, then I will be talking about the framework that we built uh, to evaluate the correctness of these uh, cookie policies. I'll describe the results and then in the la later part of this presentation I will be talking about um, how we uh, are extending this framework to also test other uh, browser uh, policies both for security and for privacy. And finally I will give a brief conclusion. So, well, I know that this is OWASP, but I'll, I'll just briefly go over some web fundamentals so that everyone is on the same page. So, here we have a web page from domain A, which includes a resource from domain B.com. So, what happens in the browser is the user visits uh, domain A.com and it requests this HTML file, uh, which will then be rendered. Uh, and the browser will see that there is a reference to this image tag uh, and it will then uh, fetch this image. So that's all very basic. Uh, so now when we uh, have HTTP cookies, uh, so some important properties about them are that they are uh, implicitly included. Usually they're used for authentication or identification and they're also subjected to the same origin policy, which means that cookies of domain A can only be accessed and read and set by domain A, and the same for domain B. So when we go back to our original example, um, our browser will uh, send along the cookies for domain A in this first request, and the second one will have the cookies of domain B. And uh, because this uh, request is to a third party, uh, so from domain A to domain B, uh, we call this cookie B a third party cookie. So how can things go wrong? Um, so uh, one of the examples is uh, cross-site request forgery. Uh, so it allows an attacker to perform authenticated actions uh, with a, under the authentication of the victim. Um, so in this example, there's a vic victim going to cutekittens.com. Uh, unfortunately, if you go to cutekittens.com, it might not always be a, well, a good actor. So it might be like a malicious actor uh, trying to, for instance, steal some money from the bank. And in this specific attack, it will try to do this by including a resource uh, through, a, through an image that will trigger some action in the uh, name of the victim. Um, and this works because cookies are implicitly included in third party requests. And well, although this issue looks fairly simple, um, there have been many uh, issues detected at very big companies like uh, YouTube, Netflix, uh, several banking websites, and so on. So, one way to mitigate this problem is to have like a token in a form or make certain things unpredictable. Um, but it's very, to, very difficult to do so uh, across all the assets of a company. So that's why we have um, a thing called same site cookies. So it's a basic cookie. Uh, it just has an, an additional attribute called same site, uh, which is instructed by the server. Uh, so the server sets this additional cookie attribute and it needs to be enforced by the client. So we, there's two options for the same site cookie. So on the one hand, there's strict uh, which makes that uh, cookies will never be included in any cross-site requests. So only first-party uh, accesses will allow this cookie to be sent along. And then there's the same site lex cookie, uh, which is the same as same site strict, but has a few exceptions such as uh, a top-level get or a pre-render. 
and um, well, same side cookies have been a lot, well, have existed for some time, or at least the uh, specification of it. Uh, but I believe that uh, once Google Chrome and Firefox and others uh, will make this the default on the web, uh, I hope that, well, it will change security for the better. So Chrome will start doing this from, uh, starting from version uh, 76. So if we go back to our um, original example of the uh, victim browsing to cute kittens. Um, so if we assume that the victim first does some operations with the bank and this bank sets two types of cookies, so a regular cookie and a same side cookie. Then uh, when the cutekittens.com tries to perform the attack, uh, the browser will only include the cookie that is not same site, so the regular cookie, and the same site cookie, um, if it's used uh, for authentication with the bank, then the bank will not be able to authenticate this victim, and so the um, funds will not be transferred to the uh, malicious party. So, as I said before, we did this um, well, evaluation of these third-party cookie policies, but why should we do this? Um, why can't we just trust the browsers that they are doing what we expect them to do? Well, we know that browsers uh, exhibit inconsistent behavior, um, so sometimes they deviate from the standard um, for certain uh, things. And also, uh, browsers are very complex and there might be certain side effects of uh, specific features uh, that may cause unexpected things to happen. And on the other hand, uh, for the browser extensions, uh, they've been known to have been bypassed in the past. So, for instance, websites like Pornhub uh, exploited uh, the WebSocket mechanism uh, to circumvent ad blockers. So, for these reasons and a couple of others more, uh, we need, there's a need for a comprehensive evaluation of the effectiveness of these cookie policies. And for this, uh, we, we created a testing framework, um, which had a certain amount of requirements. So, uh, first, we um, wanted to make sure that uh, this framework would be able to test the browser uh, in a black box perspective. Because um, for us, the source code of browsers is not always available. And even if it would be available, there's millions of lines of code uh, for each browser um, that I, or I don't think anyone, would want to go to manually. And on the on the other hand, we also wanted to evaluate the more implicit cookie policies uh, imposed by the browser extensions. Um, so our framework had to support them. And um, so we came up with something like the following. So on the one hand, we had a browser instance, which is a, a browser configured in a specific way that had a certain amount of extensions or might not have been have had an extension um, and this we uh, point at our framework and out of the framework we should be able to determine uh, whether there were any bypasses or any issues. So the global overview looks a bit like this. Um, so on the top left side uh, we have our uh, browser control which instructs the browser instance on the right. Uh, so for this we used uh, WebDriver and for browsers that did not support this we used the command line interface. Um, this browser was pointed to a number of different uh, test cases. So we, on the bottom you can see that we have a test generator which tried to trigger requests in all kinds of different ways. 
Um, and these were served to the browser. And all traffic of the browser was intercepted using a, um, yeah, a proxy. And by analyzing the traffic that passed through this proxy, we managed to evaluate whether uh, the things that went through were the things that we expected to go through. And if there was something unexpected, we considered it um, a bypass or an issue. So one of the important things of our framework is to be able to generate different test cases. Um, so we wanted to evaluate all the different mechanisms uh, that can be used to initiate a request. Um, and these can be from many different uh, categories. So we evaluate, evaluated seven different categories uh, from uh, application cache, uh, which is still, well, it's deprecated, but it's still supported by most browsers. Uh, the different types of HTML tags, uh, like script, image, link, but uh, also more uh, exotic ones. Um, also, different headers may be uh, causing the browser to send an additional request. So there's a link header, or um, if there's a violation of the content security policy, uh, it might report something to an endpoint, um, and this will also trigger an additional request. Then there are also different types of redirects, um, like using the location header or um, using a meta tag or setting the window.location property. Um, then in JavaScript, there's also many different ways to uh, send a request, for instance, using the fetch or XHR um, or more less, lesser known things like event source. Um, and then maybe a bit surprising one was um, JavaScript from PDF files. Um, so this also can be used to send both GET and POST requests. And then finally, uh, using the Service Worker API, uh, it can also be used to send requests. So once we had all these uh, test cases, we uh, took a bunch of browsers and many different extensions. So I think more than 30 extensions and um, seven or eight different browsers. And uh, we then evaluated uh, whether the explicit uh, and implicit cookie policies were, uh, well, correctly enforced by these browsers and browser extensions. So moving on to the results. Um, well, surprisingly, we found quite many uh, issues. Uh, so for instance, um, the option to block third-party cookies uh, could be bypassed entirely uh, in Chrome and Opera uh, by using the mechanism uh, to send uh, requests in uh, PDFs. Um, then in Safari version 10 and Edge version 40, uh, we found that actually the option was there, but it didn't have any effect. Um, so it might give users like a fake uh, feeling of uh, being secure. Um, then also the, the features that were built into browsers um, also didn't work as well as they should. Um, so on, uh, there's, well, both the, Fi the Opera ad blocker and Firefox uh, tracking protection um, had several bypasses in different categories. Um, so for instance, for the Firefox tracking protection, uh, by adding this header, uh, so it's a response header, um, it, would send, it would trigger a request uh, to tracker.com and it could not be blocked by the uh, built-in tracking protection. Um, but the results were even more surprising for the browser extensions. So we found that all of the extensions that we tested, so more than 30 from different browsers, uh, could actually be bypassed. And there were three main reasons why this happened. So on the one hand, uh, there were 
uh, design flaws to the uh, ecosystem of uh, these ad blocking and privacy extensions. So for instance, in Chrome, uh, PDFs are rendered as part of an extension. However, it's impossible uh, for one extension to intercept requests from another extension. So this means that all requests triggered from a PDF in Chrome uh, would not pass by the, uh, the blocking extension, uh, so they could not be, uh, these requests could not be blocked. And um, yeah, also in, in other browsers, there were um, certain types of requests. Uh, for instance, in Firefox, the favicon uh, could not be uh, intercepted by um, the extensions, which meant that all the requests went through. And then another category of where things went wrong was that the, the API and the documentation around this API was sometimes unclear. Um, so, for instance, requests triggered by service workers of, or application cache um, had an well, the tab ID that was asso associated with it uh, was set to minus one uh, in some cases um, or for certain browsers. So this made it difficult for developers to figure out whether they should actually block this request or not. And some of the extensions did not block it, which allowed uh, or which would allow an attacker to bypass them. And then finally, there were some common mistakes made by the extension developers. Um, for instance, they didn't request permission to intercept the WebSockets, uh, which meant that uh, well, by using these WebSockets, uh, the extension would be bypassed. So to get, go a bit more in detail um, of how the, um, the design flaw of the, the PDFs or the JavaScript embedded in PDFs existed. So, yeah, JavaScript can run in PDFs and it can send requests. So it can send both GET and POST requests to any type of origin. Um, so usually what you would expect is that if there's uh, this extension API, um, this request would go through it and then the extension API would be able to make a decision whether this request should be allowed or not. Uh, however, uh, since in Chrome uh, these PDFs are rendered as part of a plugin or extension, um, it doesn't actually go through this extension API because extensions can't intercept each other's requests. So it will, it will completely bypass uh, all these extensions and can still be used to track users online. And also, uh, we found that it would also for um, all the browsers, or for Chrome specifically, um, bypass the option where uh, when third-party cookies were uh, blocked. Then we also evaluated um, the same site cookie uh, and also found several issues there. Uh, so on Chrome and Opera, we found that the same site strict cookie uh, was also sent for sent for pre-render. Uh, well, this is not like a very big flaw, but uh, this same site strict cookie should not be sent in any uh, requests except for top-level gets. Uh, and pre-render is like an um, exception for uh, same site lex cookies. Uh, but in Edge, things were even worse uh, because there. Uh, even for the same site Lex, uh, there were different bypasses. So by using uh, WebSockets, uh, we found that uh, cookies would be still sent along, or if you would embed an external resource in an embed or object tag, then the same site Lex cookie would still be sent along. And yeah, similarly for same site strict, there were also different bypasses where the cookie were, was sent in ways where it shouldn't have been sent. So there's a couple of more, or quite many more, uh, issues that we discovered. Um, unfortunately, I won't have time to 
go into detail for all of them. So I invite you to uh, take a look at our paper where we uh, describe uh, everything and all the books in more detail. So now, well, we evaluated the cookie policies um, and we have this uh, nice framework that allows us to do so. And then we thought, well, what about all the other security and privacy policies that are uh, currently in the browser? So um, this is still a work in pro progress, but it's, I think it's looking quite promising. So um, we have to make some modifications to our framework, um, but the basic concept uh, is still the same. So we have a bunch of different browsers that we point at um, several test cases. And um, when a browser uh, runs one of these test cases, it will emit a certain number of uh, browser or system events. So it will make certain HP requests, it will write things to the disk, uh, it will make certain syscalls, and uh, we want to capture all of these things and then store them into the database. And we will associate all these events with the specific policy, uh, yeah, the specific policy that was uh, enforced in the test case, and the request methods, uh, and so on. So all kinds of meta information associated with these events. And then when we want to uh, validate a certain security policy, uh, we can just query this database. So if we want to know whether strict transport security is correctly implemented in all the browsers that we tested. Um, we can run like a query where we look, all, well, look for all the test cases where the strict transport security header was set. And if there was a, still a request uh, over HTTP that went through, uh, then we know that something went wrong. And then we can indicate that this test case caused um, the strict transport security uh, policy to be bypassed. I, I should mention that what's shown here is like a lot simplified, um, but this is like the main concept of how these things work. Similarly, if we want to figure out whether uh, incognito mode or private browsing mode is correctly implemented, we can write a similar query where we look for the test cases where the browser was loaded in incognito mode, and then we see if there is a certain uh, change uh, persistent on the disk, uh, which shouldn't happen. Uh, but if we do manage to find it, it indicates that there might be an issue there, and that even um, well, people might be tracked through incognito mode. So our framework uh, would allow to validate the correctness uh, of how uh, certain privacy or security policies are enforced by the browser. Uh, it will, by design, support all different browsers uh, because we don't look at any type of source codes. We just need to point the browsers at the different test cases. And not only will we be able to test the different browsers, but we can test them in different types of configurations. And uh, also, we can see if certain browser extensions may influence the uh, validity of certain uh, security features. And one of the, the main things is that, or the difficult things, is that we should uh, make the test cases as complete as possible, such that uh, like we cover the entire spectrum of what could possibly go wrong. Uh, so therefore we will have to fuss um, the different ways of uh, how requests can be made or how different uh, operations happen in the browser. Um, unfortunately, there's um, the web platform tests, which already has a large set of uh, different use cases. Um, and well, hopefully sometime in the future, this framework will be, uh, could be used uh, by browser vendors to test uh, their browser uh, and validate that they are implemented correctly and that the 
features are correctly enforced. Um, that brings me to the conclusion. So um, I believe that we all know that browsers are very complex. They consist of uh, many different APIs or they support many different A APIs and they need millions of lines of code to do so. Um, therefore, uh, I think that an extensive evaluation is required um, because there's the, all these different mechanisms that has, have uh, unexpected influences on each other. Uh, so we should cover the entire uh, ecosystem. So we should look at all the different uh, mechanisms that can be used to send a request. Uh, we should see what the influence of browser extensions are uh, and so on. And our uh, evaluation on the cookie policies uh, already showed uh, that this is a good approach because we discovered several issues, um, so several bypasses for uh, the security policies as well as the privacy policies by uh, browser extensions. And so we're working on a framework to evaluate the different security and privacy policies in the browsers. So I'd like to thank you for coming here and well, watching me talk and then I'm open to your questions. So thank you for your talk and the research. Uh, you have mentioned that uh, you had discovered uh, uh, same site cookies with uh, strict attribute enabled uh, uh, sends with pre-rendered requests. Uh, yeah. It was for the original uh, origin or for different origins? Um, I mean, is it possible here cross-site scripting request, uh, cross-site request forgery attack or not? Um, yeah, I, I can't find the slide. Um, so, um, in the case of, uh, in Chrome, um, wait, let me. So maybe it's uh, okay for the same origin sorry? to make such requests. Can, can you? Ah, maybe it's uh, not a security issue. I mean, if we, if we have uh, the same origin and we use uh, pre-rendered requests, uh, maybe it's not a security issue to send it with uh, same site strict uh, cookies. Um, not a what, what is the security impact of uh, send cookies uh, for pre-rendered requests with same site strict attribute enabled? So, uh, here in Edge, um, the same site cookies could be, well, or were sent along uh, with, uh, well, the WebSocket API and the embed and object. So, um, well, these only allowed to send GET requests, um, which is, I think, for, um, it's not such a big problem uh, for, um, uh, cross-site request for free, um, but there are other issues uh, such as cross-site leaks um, where uh, this will be an issue actually. And uh, it was uh, discovered in case of the same origin or origin were different? Ah, yeah, yeah, different origins of course. Oh, okay, thank you. By the way, uh, did you contact uh, with uh, some browser uh, developers? Or something like that? Yeah, we reported all the issues that we discovered, uh, both to the browser vendors as well as to the extension developers. Uh, unfortunately, there's still um, quite some issues that are not fixed yet. Okay, thank you.